Hello and welcome to the Irish Game Dev Podcast Season 2 with me, your host, Jeff Newman. Over the next few weeks, I'll be interviewing members of the Irish Game Dev community. This week, I'm talking to Colm Lurkin of Camberness. Just in this last year, they've released their first game, Guild of Dungeoneering, on PC. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Jeff, for having me on. No problem. Um, so I'm Colm, like you said, I'm the original person behind Gamerness because it started as a one-man band kind of thing. It was just my place to make games. And I'll be making, you know, game jam level games and starting projects that I never finished for years. And yeah, then with Gilded Engineering, which I started in late 2013, um, it kind of started to come together. And yeah, then from there, I like ended up teaming up with a few people and then eventually hiring a couple of people. And by the time the game came out uh, last July, there were five people. Four of us were full time, and one was uh, Fred, who, who did all the art. He was still just doing it in his free time outside a day job. Um, and then, you know, since then, now there's um, two of us full time plus Fred part time, and still collaborating with people like, uh, you know, like Steve, who did all the music. So it's it's kind of fuzzy how many people work for Gambrinus because <laughs> then. Oh, that's cool. Um, so yeah, do you, like um, I know if if people have previously li- listening to this have watched the Irish Game Dev documentary from like twenty fourteen, um, just talking. I think you gave a little bit of a history about how you got started on Guild. But do you want to give another little bit of background? Yeah. <clears throat> so it it started as kind of thing I was doing uh, for one game a month, um, which is a really cool um, kind of solo game jam idea where you can just very casually make a game each month and. Um, Myself and a friend started organizing a Dublin meetup to showcase one game a month games. That's been running now for it's almost three years. We've been doing that every month. Uh, and as part of starting that, I actually did try and make a game every month. Um, so in the first six months, I think I made four different games. Uh, and one of those was a really rough kind of tile laying dungeon exploration game. And after six months, I just, I, I'd become much more productive just committing to this deadline and I decided to take one of my rough prototypes and try and make it into a bigger game. And that became Gilded Engineering. Um, And as I started working on it, the scope grew and grew um, kind of hand in hand with people's appreciation of the games. And we kind of started getting a little bit of press and a little bit of notice um, from people. So I kind of decided to, you know, go in on it. Um, And then over time, you know, I gave up my job and, you know, all, all through that time I was working as a software engineer. Um, but eventually I gave that up and I just went full time, um, salary, you know, without a salary, um, on the game. And, uh, yeah. And then it just grew and grew from there. We, we, uh, eventually finished it last July. Oh, that's cool. Um, so how, how, how has it been since finishing? Cause I don't, I don't think I've talked to you since. No. Um, I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> I like, think so. You have to say that it's really amazing to finish something and to get it out there. Um, but it's also been difficult. So uh, the game has like um, been more successful than than I could have hoped for before releasing it. Yeah. Um, but it's also it's funny. It's also kind of exhausting and difficult um, when you release something um, for various reasons. So you know, um, dealing. Even even dealing with the success slightly is quite difficult, um, which is a funny one. Some, certainly something I didn't expect going into this. How how so? What 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 do you mean by that? So the game did really well. We got featured in loads of magazines. Loads and loads of streamers played it. Loads of people bought it. Uh, and the game itself is a little bit polarizing. So some people really love it, and some people really hate it and get very angry um, about you know certain things in the game and those people tend to you know write messages on the steam forums or on like user reviews or email us and just dealing with that so kind of dealing with our fan base both people who love and hate the game that's one kind of has a slight emotional toll sound silly but like you know when when you make something and it's popular um i didn't realize this but you have to deal with that oh okay okay um so and then secondly the success itself is funny um, this might be just something I do, but yeah. I don't know if it is. But basically, when you reach a certain level of 
success with something you make, suddenly you want more. Yeah. So I did. And so everything, you know, um, I just wanted more. I, you know, I'd be looking at other um, ways that we could be doing better, even though um, very much uh, already I was doing better than anything I could have hoped for. Okay. Um, so you, the game you finish up with is what you were picturing all along, yes? Yeah, yeah. So I'm certainly at the scope of the game. So it's like a single player game. You can finish it in like 10 or 15 hours. Um, the scope, that kind of side of it, I'm really happy with. I'm glad we stuck to kind of that scope because uh, it was hard enough finishing it at all. Yeah. Um, we're still working on it. We've kept kind of adding features over the uh, following six months. Um, we made one small expansion. I think we'll make at least one more small expansion and then we'll kind of think about it. Um, but we've been releasing just kind of free updates. Um, we're coming out with a fairly big new game mode that's just going to be free. Um, and then we're working on a couple extra things. So we're working on like an iPad and iPhone port, probably Android later. And then we're going to look at consoles as well. Oh, cool. Um, so yeah. We've been busy with it. Yeah, because that's I think you've been championing game like at lot numerous shows and um, showcases and stuff before, but you kind of circumvent the whole early access thing, did you? Yeah, I totally skipped that. Um, so particularly with our kind of game, I didn't think it was a good idea. Um, but regardless, if you choose to do early access, it's a lot of work. Mm. Um, you're sharing a rough version of the game sometimes. You're trying to get people to buy into the idea that they're kind of testing game isn't finished and you're going to make big changes and i've seen that in other like really great and successful early access games is that they have a bit of a fight to do around managing their fan base and uh, making sometimes unpopular changes um so er early access is, isn't a free lunch and I'd, I'd i'd be very very careful and cautious about going into early access um, I'm, I'm very glad we didn't oh okay you didn't have any um previous ideas are like oh maybe we should have you were ha very happy that you went out with a finished product initially and then just added on to it afterwards yeah and i mean it's funny because what's the difference like you know if we're releasing a game and still making changes to it or if we called it early access and and did it yeah um you know there there's not a huge amount of difference between the two things i mean we we tried to make the game when it launched was you know maybe at a a more definite level of quality than maybe if we were choosing to do early access. But apart from that, there's not much difference when you release a game and you keep updating it. Um, you know, the name early access is only a few years old, but a few people were making games like that. So Minecraft famously like yeah. came out, was just constantly changing over the years. And do you think there's like been a bit of a stigma attached to early access? Because as you're describing, it's like it kind of felt like you were doing early access, even though the game was released and you were just adding more to it. Because I've heard there is yeah, a bit of stigma, like, definitely. Yeah. Um, I think it, it benefits the most um, games that are kind of more sandboxy rather than um, linear. So oh, okay. we have a kind of a linear campaign you play through. Um, while if you're making a game, say like Dwarf Fortress or anything really where it's more like a sandbox you're playing in rather than an experience you're playing through, then they're the games I think that make sense for early access where you're um, tweaking systems and seeing what people do with them rather than producing content and seeing how people experience it. Oh. So our, ours, our game is certainly about content that you experience. So to me, it just never made sense that that's early access. Yeah, it wouldn't it wouldn't match well with the idea of people replaying it and replaying it as you change things. Okay, yeah, and especially as like um, as you came out like as a full game, you got like lots of um, I, I this is just my own thinking that you probably wouldn't have got as much coverage from like bigger websites and bigger streamers if it yes, wasn't early that, access so game. Exactly, yeah, that's that's also a concern. I think if you go into early access. Obviously, you want to find players. Otherwise, why would you release an early access at all? So you need to make some news, say the game is in early access. And then in time, you want to finish the game and launch it. But you, you have diluted that, uh, kind of the hype a bit yeah. by necessity. So yeah, you do, you do see that with early access games. There's a, if they're doing their job well, they get some hype that they're in early access. And then when they come to launch, um, 
they have lost some of that expectation from press and from players. So people who are dying to play your game, but it's not out yet. Oh, okay. Good. We worked quite hard to build that up. Yeah. Um. How did you? Yeah. Did you work that hype? Because yeah, I mentioned you like you were at numerous shows and um, yep, all so, over the place. Lots. Um. This time last year, so January, um, we signed up with a publisher, an indie focused publisher called Versus Evil, um, and they've been fantastic. But their their main task was to do that was to uh, get us to some of the biggest, you know, um, gamer shows. So like PAX, Penny Arcade Expo, yeah. um, to showcase the game, get us in front of press, and basically build up to a really big launch. They did a great job there. They're also really nice to work with. Um, so last year, between January and July, when we launched, we hit PAX South, PAX East, um, E3, which is in L.A., um, GDC, where we had a huge big press event, um, and Eurogamer Expo, I think it was in London, uh, and we went to Casual Connect in Amsterdam, and in all those places we were showing the game, and that's something I couldn't have done by myself. So I, that wasn't that wasn't materially possible for me without doing this deal with the publisher, um, and it made a huge difference to uh, getting our game on people's radar. So that was streamers, press, and players. And it all built up over those six months into a large amount of um, uh, expectation or hype around when the game was coming out. And we saw a huge, huge amount of press, a huge amount of streamers and huge amount of people like looking at the game. Um, and it helped us get onto, I think, that, you know, we ended up uh, on the top 10 like um, list for Steam on our launch day. Oh, wow. And we dropped out couple of days later but that was still amazing and i don't think we'd have managed that if we hadn't built up the kind of hype levels over time oh cool yeah it's, it's like i'm i think i remember seeing you like um posting about um yeah some of the streams and stuff you're up because uh you were like i think yeah there was a massive um irish stream going on on st patrick's day last year right like daniel dwyer on That's GameSpot. Right. Um, but there was a few, like, f- good few other outlets and stuff that you were featured on and stuff. Is there any good story yeah, behind them? Yeah, um, kind of too many to count. So <laughs> on, on YouTube, I think one of our biggest videos is um, to- by Total Biscuit. Oh, wow. And he he did a, like, um, a video on Gilded Engineering about a week after we launched. Actually, I think it was only about two two or three days after we launched. And I think I think that video has, like... 300,000 views on it right now, maybe more. Uh, and and there's just lots and lots of people like that on YouTube. And then Twitch, which is like the live version of that, it was just constant. There were just people day or night, around launch week in particular, day or night, if you opened up Twitch and looked at the Gilded, you know, who's playing Gilded Engineering right now, yeah. there'd be a whole load. And I'd just drop into streams. There'd be like, you know, 100 or 1,000 people watching. And then it, you know, when there's a thousand people watching, the chat room is like broken. There's too many people. <laughs> when there are only a um, hundred people, I could actually chat to people and say, hi, I'm the developer. And, you know, if you have questions, I'll answer them. And that was really interesting. That's cool. Yeah. So yeah. How d- did you make a plan for managing that? Or are you just like, oh, I'm just going to go through a few streams and chat to people or. Um, so part of this is making sure that anyone who wants to stream the game has a copy of the game for free. Yeah. So that, that just makes sense. Um, so some streamers will buy the game, but they, they shouldn't have to. It's it's like like press. You're giving them away, you know, copies so that they can at least share it with their fans. Yeah. Um, so our publisher handled all that. They did a really good job. They have a dedicated person who's their uh, person for managing PC streamers and making sure they know who they are and what kind of games they play and get them a copy of our game. And they did a great job. Um Actually dropping in and just chatting, that was just something I, basically we on the team did because it was so fun. But it's also a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I think I've seen a few of your comments on, um, I think it was like uh, Giant Bomb had a quick look of it and I've seen comments, I'm not sure if it was you or one of the guys just talking about the game as a few people were commenting about the video. I thought that was really yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I've always been pretty active on, so I, way back through development of the game, I've been very open about development, so 
I actually shared a playable version of the game since day one, which would have been October 2013, and it was really rough, totally so far from finished. And I, um, I kept a thread up on TIG Source where I updated that build and got feedback from people. So I, I'm basically used to watching people talk about the game and responding to them wherever they are. So if I notice people talking about it on Twitter, um, sometimes I'd respond, certainly if they ever posted directly to me, so like on TIG Source or emailed me, I'd always respond to people. So um, people playing it live on Twitch, it's just a natural extension of that. It was very easy for me to just uh, notice when that's happening and jump in and chat to people. Oh, cool. So it wasn't like a whole like, oh my God, all these people in my game. Oh. Yeah, like I, like I mentioned earlier, it starts like that, but you get very blasé about it. You're like, oh, there's like, you know, such and such is playing the game and like thousands of people are watching live. Yes. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you just come to expect it. Yeah, you do. You very much do. And then, um, as is the nature of games, that the filters away. So yeah. if we look right now, there's nobody playing Gilded Engineering on Twitch. Um, but I'll still notice um, occasional ones, and I'll pop in. But um, it, it's um, topical. Like people, all the biggest people play the kind of uh, new game of the week almost. Okay. Um, so what were like some of the biggest hits you got like um, from big YouTubers or streamers or whatever about the game? Um, I think I mentioned this before. My favorite one is uh, Felicia Day um, has a video series called Co-Optitude where she plays games with her brother. Yeah. And I was already a fan of Felicia Day from a thing she did called The Guild. It's like a TV show initially produced for YouTube. It's really great. It's about people... Uh, the real lives of people in an MMO guild. Oh yeah, I remember that. It's really cool. Um, so um, basically, she played the game on her channel, and it's her and her brother playing and fighting over it, and it's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> it's it's my favorite. It's basically my favorite ad for Gilded Engineering. <laughs> it's really cool. Um, and we got that video actually in a very funny way. So um, about a week before release. Um, so when you play Gilded Engineering, you get these very disposable, um, heroes and you send them off to their near certain death and you kind of, your graveyard gets fuller and fuller. Um, so you keep getting new heroes basically. Yeah. Um, so we had this really big name list of, um, kind of random fantasy names, uh, that gets picked from when you get a new one. Um, and we added basically all our own names, uh, our wives' names, um, and a few things like that. And just the week before launch fred who did the art basically volunteered to go in and have a look at this um name list which had thousands of names in it yeah. and just remove some of the weirder ones or ones that were too long uh and he basically snuck in a name as he was editing it um that to me just looked like any other name it was anus a-n-u-s-s -S. um what i didn't realize was that was um uh like reference to this recurring character in this co-optitude show that uh, Felicia and uh, Ryan Day r run. Um, it's one of their like names from their childhood D&D oh. games or something like that. Um, and they use it often when they get to choose names in a game. And I didn't realize this, but Fred basically threw that in there um, on purpose so that if another fan of, of uh, their show was playing Gilded Engineering and spotted a Nuss come up as their name that they might... Um, take a screenshot and send it to the to the guys, and that's exactly what happened. Oh wow! Well. So when that happened, we we're like, "Hey, why are you know why are they tweeting?" You know, and you could see um, Felicia today tweeting back, going, "Oh my god, that's amazing!" <laughs> and, and Fred said, "Ha ha, it was my evil plan all along," because he he is a fan. So basically, instead of us targeting them directly, which yeah. is you can do, but isn't as powerful as basically a random fan doing it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that was kind of cool. Cool. And so that that specifically led them to make the video because they actually say at the start of their video we had a different game that we were going to play but blah 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 we saw this name come up <laughs> so they just have to go for this one yeah so I mean you can you know if you if you I uh, guess do your research but more likely if you're a fan of uh, certain uh, streamers and you know what they're into then you know build that into your game or find some sort of reference that they can enjoy and make sure it's there. No, oh, that's cool. Um, so yeah, earlier you just mentioned kind of like a little bits of what the future is for you. Um, like yeah. Adding on to the game or different versions. Yeah, so we're porting it everywhere we can take it. Um, so 
Uh, mobile is an obvious one for the style of the game. It's very simple. It's shortish uh, sessions and kind of longer metagame. Uh, so that's an obvious one. That's going to be our next release sometime in the next few months, I think. We're working through it. Yeah. Consoles is a little harder because we have to do a bigger port because of what we built the game with. Um, but I think it'd still be worthwhile. Um, basically, the game has done well enough that it's it's um, it's well worth our while to port and to do expansions. So we're kind of happy to do that for a while. Um, I would say we'll probably not start on a brand new project till maybe late the you know towards the end of this year at earliest. Oh, okay. So you're still so at the same saying... time we've kept quite small, so I haven't expanded really. In fact, we've maybe shrunk a little. Yeah. But you're still fairly focused on Guild of Dungeon. Yeah, at the moment, entirely focused. Oh, okay, I, cool. I think that's going to change for a little while. That's cool. Um, so yeah, you just mentioned like some of the other guys. Um, yeah. So what are like some of them are still working with you or? Yeah. Always? So um, our main design. So it started that I was everything except art, and Fred did the art, and so I was essentially business guy, game design, and programmer. And then uh, Owen Canavan joined as programmer. And so then I was just very lightly supervising that. And then um, last January, I hired Ollie uh, to do game design. So again, I was just lightly supervising that. Um, so I was left with kind of business and kind of, I think I can, kind of became more like a director or producer mm-hmm. of just kind of reviewing everything and um, kind of keeping the vision kind of going and then dipping in and doing bits of game design, bits of programming where, where needed. Um, uh, but sorry, but Ollie then left to pursue his own, uh, games just after we launched. Yeah. So I hired another game designer, Manuel, um, who helped us produce our first expansion that came out in September, but then he actually left in November as well. So we're <laughs> down to myself and own as the full-time people. Fred is still part-time doing the art. And then uh, Steve did all the music, and it was pretty much a full-time job up until release. Yeah. So he's he's now still in, in contact with us, but he doesn't have like full-time work from us. Okay. And um, yeah, throughout development, um, what way did you work, with, like, especially like with Fred all the way in Australia? Yeah, so Fred is in Australia, uh, which is nine or 11 hours ahead, depending on winter and summer. Yeah. Um, Ollie, who I mentioned, was game design for six months. He was in London, actually. Um, so basically, uh, the project started with me and Fred, um, and we both had full-time jobs and he was in Australia and I was in Ireland. So it was all always, um, kind of coordinating online. So when it was just the first, when it was just the two of us, um, it was basically, I would Skype him yeah. every few weeks and we'd chat about things and he'd produce art in his free time and kind of, it worked really well where he'd kind of produce a backlog of art. So he'd kind of make art and there's usually more art than I could handle and then over time I'd work on features and integrate some of the art and that worked great for us as as a pair of people working like that um when Owen joined and when uh, Steve joined they both joined around the same time um I switched to Slack which is a kind of persistent chat room with built-in you know uploading of images and stuff yeah. and I've, I basically made the conscious decision to make that our workplace so we didn't use um, group emails or really Skype at all and instead focused on everything in this one place. And it's really great for it. Um, so if Fred um, wanted feedback on like concept art even or even like halfway done some art, he'd post into Slack, I'd answer, but also everyone else could see it and answer. Um, if we had bug fixes, now we did use uh, some very light kind of uh, task management with uh, Trello it's just like a very simple to-do list. But pretty much Slack was um, how we coordinated the whole whole development of the game. Oh, that's cool. So it was, it was fairly easy then within that you didn't need like all bug trackers and such? Yeah, I mean, so we had a few tools. So we used Git um, for version control. So yeah. I'm, I'm a programmer is my background. So that, that was really natural for me. So like that's to manage the code. Then we used Dropbox to manage assets so uh, art and stuff like that trailers whatever that fred was working on we use dropbox just to coordinate with them and we use this thing called trello very lightly to to keep track of bugs so like particularly when we launched 
uh, or say the month before launch, keeping track of things that needed to be done just so we didn't forget about them. Oh, okay, okay. Um, but for day-to-day chat or coordination, it was all in the Slack chat room. That's cool. That's cool. And um, I've, heard, I've heard a lot of people collaborating with Slack now. Yeah, yeah, that's getting quite popular. That's I've started trying to use it myself, but yeah, I, I really haven't got into it, but I haven't forced myself just to use that because everything I'm still badly using stuff over email. Where should I should. If if you ever get in, if you ever end up working on a project with more than two people, try it. It'll, it'll change your mind, I think. <laughs> this podcast is sponsored by Slack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. Um. Yeah, just like one thing. Like while you're making the game, that wasn't the only thing that you were essentially creating, was it? And how? Because you had a was it a daughter or son? That's right. I was also creating a daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my daughter Anna was born in October 2014. She's uh, over one now. Um, so she was born, and then I entered a really busy time. So we signed the publishing deal a couple months later, uh, hired two more people and kind of settled down to the final six months of production of the game. Um, so when the game came out, she was seven or eight months old. Um, we were just kind of finding our feet as parents. Um, my wife went back to work then just a few weeks before we launched, um, which meant we both actually switched to a four-day week. Okay. So I work, I work a four-day week and on Mondays... I mind Anna for the day, and my wife does it on Fridays. So yeah. you know, to minimize kind of our childcare bills, uh, but also to spend time as parents with our child. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I'm, you know, part time, I guess. Um, certainly not five day a week. Yeah, um, yeah. Because that's what cool. I, I was thinking nice. that was like fairly crazy if you're doing. Because I hear lots of people like, oh yeah, working on in indie games, especially like how stressful it can be. And then also, we're a parent for the first time. How stressful that can be. Yeah, I mean, you just put all two of them together. <laughs> parent. So being a parent is difficult, and you can be low on sleep and stuff like that. But um, eventually, your body just kind of adapts. You just accept it as the new reality. I think um, maybe do, maybe people do that who work too hard um, on their on their game do that as well. But it certainly happens to to parents. So you just kind of get used to it. Um, but also. Just in our life, um, we've taken steps to make sure we don't, you know, we're not like, it's not too difficult. So like neither of us has a really long commute to work, for example. And obviously now uh, when I gave up the job, it was even easier because I work from home. So there's zero commute. <laughs> we've all set our hours. We're doing a four day week each. We've, we've worked around it to maximize kind of our time. Okay. So you're just taking all your stride then. Yeah. And on the game development side of it, well before I got into um, making Gilded Engineering, I, I really strongly was against long hours, so yeah. personally, but also also um, from a production side of it. So even even looking at Gilded Engineering as a kind of evil overlord, um, I actually think you, you get a better get better uh, creativity and and actually even long term productivity uh, from people who aren't working insanely long hours every day. Um, so I, I'm really all about everyone working um, steadily and working a normal eight hour a day, five days a week, not working at the weekend, not working long hours. I mean, we've done it occasionally. So the, the couple of weeks leading up to launch and just after launch when everything was broken, you know, we were working like maniacs. Um, but that was not long running. So, you know, I, I mentioned we had a busy six months leading up to launch pretty much throughout those six months. I was really happy with the amount, like the, the normality of our work hours. Yeah, it's something I feel really strongly about, and I want to ensure that now, as a company, that's something we do. Oh, that's very good. Um, so as long as I being like um, well, still kind of a new parent, um, found your own company as well. You're also um helped start up a whole new. Um, I don't know how to describe it really, just a working group? Yeah, association, that'd be the good yeah. word. <laughs> that's what we call ourselves. So that's Immersh. Um, so that's the Irish Game Makers Association. Um, yeah, so that, that actually came about, I think you'd have been at the chats that kind of caused that. So uh, GDC in 2015, a bunch yeah. of us uh, Irish indies, I guess you'd call us, 
um, were kind of lamenting the fact that there wasn't there wasn't really no representation at GDC or anywhere of uh, games being made in Ireland. And we were kind of saying, wouldn't it be cool if there was a way to do that? And maybe there should be like, maybe we should get together and organize something. Uh, and basically, I didn't. Um, a bunch of the other people in the Irish community did did exactly that, set up Immersh. Um, and I was very busy trying to finish Gilded Engineering. Yeah. Um, but I knew about it, and I knew everyone involved, and I was very interested. Uh, and basically, um, when August came around, the people who had set it up had just set it up as a kind of six months temporary board, and they set it up where they had open elections in the Irish community um, to elect the board that would then run it for the following year. Um, so I ran and got elected. Um, so I've been involved in that since August, uh, and it's it's really cool. Um, so, for example, um, we have a, a twenty five. Um, free passes for all access passes for GDC um, through the GDC scholarship program oh, wow. that Immer was able to get and hand out to Irish game devs. Um, so um, in a couple of months in GDC 2016, we're going to have way more Irish game makers there than ever before, I think. So it's just kind of cool what, what, what you can kind of achieve if particularly as a group, you can kind of rally around and get things done. That's really cool. So it's like a, a very other things kind of bubbling away as well. Yeah, there's lots of things that come from Emirate now in the next few months. Yeah, so um, one of the things I'm spearheading, just because I'm so interested in it, is a series of talks, not unlike this podcast you're doing. Yeah, um, we're just we're getting people from the international game development uh, community to to just log on online and, and chat to our members. Um, so we're just getting like you know. Uh, other indie devs or like people working in like EA or just anyone in games to talk about their kind of specialty uh, for an hour online to our members. And that's worked out really well. Um, so that's one of the things I'm directly involved in. And what's but, that uh, called? I think it was it. Oh, was that Immert Inspire? That is Immert Inspire. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I like giving things silly names. <laughs> <laughs> Good alliteration. But in time, in time, we've big plans um, to do all kinds of things, um, and already actually we've we've achieved more than I thought possible. So it's kind of only been up and running uh, like six months. Yeah. So it's it's really already to me really impressive. There's loads going on already. Yeah, I suppose that's gonna like a lot of talk from the likes of Vimmer, whatever got me inspired to go back and do this podcast. So lots of stuff, cool stuff oh, that's in cool. Ireland again. So. Yeah. So it's interesting to hear the stories. You're you're based in London, right? Yeah. Um, but I think you're aware of just kind of how it, it grew up here. The last yeah. last three or four years has kind of changed. Yeah. That, um, be, become amazing, I think. Yeah, it's, it's definitely grown up because um, originally, I um, I think it would might have been 2011. I was in Canada, or did I come back? I'm. Um, Fairly, yeah, it was 2011. I was in Canada. I came back then in 2012, and I already heard some things happening there. And then, just even since then, there was like rumblings of s s small teams, or whatever, kicking off, like making these small like Unity games. And it's gotten massive since now. It's just it's it it's amazing. Yeah, I don't know what what caused it. I mean, lot lots of small things all kind of bubbled up together. I think. So even the one little thing I was involved in, which was the one game a month meetup, yeah, I think that had an effect. Um, I think one of the main things was another bigger event called Dubludo. Yeah. But again, that grew from all the other things. So, you know, more game jams were happening, more, there was just a, a lot more reason to network and meet each other. And it, it, it's kind of bubbled into all the things and including the creation of Immerse. Immerse happened because of all these other community things, because there was a community. And mm. then, it's really cool, and I'm very glad that it it came together around the same time as I basically jumped into games. That's cool. That's cool. And I think that's going to stand to us, kind of, in future that we have this community. Yeah, very strong so, community. Yeah. So basically, if you're making a game by yourself right now in Dublin, there's several events you can bring your game to, meet other people, find a collaborator, you know, find someone who'll do music for you. 
um, just a place where you can turn up with your laptop and get feedback from people. Like all that kind of stuff is really invaluable. A place you can ask for advice, you can look around, see, oh, there's someone who's published their game on Steam. There's someone else who's published their game on the PlayStation. I'm going to ask them what's involved, you know, in a really casual way. And the fact that we have that now is, is super. And do you think it's it's pretty um, promising as well that all this is pretty much grassroots um, type of like activities going on rather than some massive company coming in from overseas and setting bit setting up base? Yeah, um, I prefer that that way of growing things. I you know I like I like trying to bootstrap things. So like how I tried to make Gilded Engineering initially was like that um, rather than. Let's say I was making a company and I went and got like investment and uh, VC capital and stuff. Uh, it's just kind of not my style. Um, so I like that the community is also kind of grassroots and grew rather than was kind of implanted, um, but also out of necessity. So uh, we weren't getting really any help from the Irish government, for example. There's there's no specific tax breaks for homegrown uh, game development in Ireland, and uh, there is in the UK. Um, stuff like that. And I, I think now that we've basically just kind of kept going and made our own community and are making and publishing games as well, um, you know, that's something we can maybe maybe go back to the government and talk to them about it and try and try and find some way for them to to help the, you know, to help local talent make games here in Ireland. Um, you know, the fact that we've, even without it, we've made it happen. Yeah, it's really cool. It gets to show like this is what's happening, and especially yeah, now this year as well. GDC, so much going to go on. I believe. Yeah, exactly. And you know, from just one of the cool things about making games is that your market is international. Yeah. So, um, all you know, from uh, Ireland's point of view, that's it's exports. Um. So people outside Ireland are buying an Irish game. Money is coming into Ireland. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's one of the things that grows the economy. Um, so games are just a natural thing that uh, kind of are always going to be an export. Um, so yeah, there's this GDC coming now in March, um, along with the like was it twenty five scholarships you got for um, Irish game devs? Yeah. Um, what do you think is going to happen throughout this time? Do you like because you're saying it's possibly one of the biggest Irish invasion essentially of San Francisco. Yeah, there's always a mini Irish invasion. We tend to cluster up quite funnily. Um, so this will be my third year going. Um, it'll be my first year going as a published game dev, which is interesting. This is the first time I'll have previously released a game, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Up until then, I was just a, kind of an aspiring game developer. Um, so f- for me personally, it's going to be just very interesting from that point of view because I'll be kind of I don't know maybe I'll feel like more of a peer rather than a someone hoping to break in yeah um, and secondly I think I'll have more time for it so last year uh, part of the deal was I was doing two days of press demoing demoing our work in progress game to the press which was amazing um, but meant I missed a lot of what I would normally experience at GDC like talks um, so I'm kind of looking forward to going back to GDC and taking in what everyone else has done and talked about. Um, so I think that's going to be cool. And then, yeah, obviously we'll have a much bigger amount of devs from Ireland attending and we're trying to organize some events via Immert and you're organizing a, a, a meetup one evening. Um, so I think, yeah, there's going to be a lot more on, which is cool. Yeah, I think that's a was the part of the reason why I was like I was hearing there was so many going on, and especially with the centenary of the Easter Rising in Ireland, I just thought it was a kind of good time. Along as also St Patrick's Day during GDC, during TGC, yeah. yeah. So I was like, oh, oh it it just seems like you have to do it this year with how many people are going over and everything just lining up. So, so yeah, if people are listening to this before GDC, um, it should be Soda Popinski's on seventeenth of March, and um, from about I think six thirty. So come on down for um, drinks, and that's about it. <laughs> Meet some Irish devs. Yeah. Well, you should have some games up to be playable around, but I'm still sorting out all those finer details, but we'll figure it out closer to the time. Nice. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. That should be really cool. 
Um, yeah, just, oh, I don't know why I took it upon myself to organize things now. <laughs> it's great. It's wonderful. Overwhelming everything. Um, if each person organizes one thing, we get a lot of stuff organized. Yeah, we've got a massive week of uh, stuff going on. It should be fun. Um, anything to actually say so the many, because I know a lot of the scholarships people um, are first timers. Is there anything you would say to them if they're listening? Yeah, so um, uh, when I went for the first time, I was working on Gilded Engineering, which just in my free time. I'd given in my notice. By the time I left to get on the plane that time, I'd given in my notice. Um, so a few weeks after I came back, I was quit and working full time on the game. But when I booked it, certainly I, I had no plans yet. Um, so I basically went that first year and had no real you know, business objectives, had no massive meetings with anyone or demos of the game. I really just went and went to all the talks, tried to meet people, and my goal was to be inspired, and that really did work. Uh, I came back from GDC that year, and I was I was so pumped to, to make my game and to to do what I was seeing other people do. Um, so from that point of view, it's, it's really amazing. So if you ever have the chance to get to GDC and you're into making games, go. So something like this scholarship opportunity, I think is pretty cool, pretty amazing. I'm so glad that we're, that it was right. And so if that had been there a couple of years ago, I would have grabbed onto it with two hands. It would have been really cool. Yeah. So it's a great opportunity for those people. Yes, yeah. So go meet people, chat to everyone you meet, um, go to the talks and have a great time. It's a really cool, cool event. Okay. What would you say to some of the people that like they meet some devs they know that release a game that they loved or something and want to ask them questions? Like, how is it like just walking up to someone like that? Yeah, I mean, I I had trouble with that because I don't I didn't recognize people. You know, yeah. I probably walked past many people whose games I admire uh, without knowing it was them. Uh, but if you're at smaller gatherings, you'll get talking to people. Um, so go to events, obviously, is one bit of advice. Um, but just be willing to chat to people and ask what they're making, you know? Yep. Uh, and you'll you'll meet people, and it's really interesting, you know? And you will you may be introduced to people who've made games that you love, and chat to them. They're all people like yourself and very, very friendly in general and very willing to talk to you and give you advice even if you have questions. So absolutely approach people and chat to people. That's cool. And um yeah, I think as a member as well, if a few of the Irish people a few years ago, like um when the likes of like John Romero walking around or Tim Schafer and stuff, it's like, Oh my god his games from whatever the nineties. Just being slightly starstruck, I remember that. I was like <laughs> yeah, myself I was a bit like, Oh wow, these people are so cool. Yeah, I think it's pretty normal. Um <laughs> I on the plane over for that first GDC I I brought um Masters of Doom, which is the book about ID back in the early days, yeah, and and then that first year, uh, John Romero had a like Doom Deathmatch booth set up, and he was playing Deathmatch games against people. I was really pretty. I didn't even go up and say hi. I was too too amazed. Uh, <laughs> nowadays, he lives in Ireland, and we get to see him a lot more. So you're not a starstruck anymore. No, not as much. <laughs> um. So yeah, thank you, Colin, for uh, taking time to talk to us. Um. I hope it was a pleasure for you. It wasn't too awkward a conversation. Thanks yeah. so much for having me. It was oh, really fun. really great to come on and chat about things. Ah, right, cool. Um, and so, yeah, your website is gambrinus.com, I believe. Yeah, and that's also my Twitter handle, gambrinus. And that's, was it G A M B O R I O U S? B R I N O U S. Oh, okay. Well, pretty much if you Google gambrinus, you'll get yeah, I think I've, I've known a few times I've misspelled it. Even if you misspell it, you know, you'll find it. Okay, well, thank you very much for uh, joining me on the call. Goodbye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.